This is ChestertonRadio.com. And here's the cinnamon bell. we go with the story of Judy and Jimmy and the cinnamon bear. If you'll remember, the twins went up into the attic to hunt for a missing Christmas tree ornament, the silver star. While searching through an old trunk, they found a little toy cinnamon bear only four inches tall. But when they looked at him through the big telescope, he got very much larger and started to talk to them. What's more, he told Judy and Jimmy that he could show them how to degrow until they were just as small as he, so they could all chase the crazy quilt dragon who had stolen their beautiful silver star out of the trunk. At this very minute, Judy is mighty anxious to learn all about this business of degrowing. Please hurry and tell us how to get small cinnamon bear. Of course, of course. Well, <clears throat> it's really quite simple, you know. It's all in the way you look at it. Now, just uh, pardon me a moment. Do you mind very much if I make one special growl at this spider here? He's been making faces at me, and it's very distracting. All right, but please hurry. It won't take a second. One, two. Growl. <laughs> he ran so fast you could hear him whistle. That's our most effective growl, don't you think? Of course. It's wonderful, Cinnamon Bear. But we've just got to get smaller right away, or we'll never get crazy quilt. Oh, yes. Uh, let's see now. As I was saying, it's all in the way you look at it. We're only as big as we see we are. I don't understand what you mean, Cinnamon Bear. Well, you're used to seeing yourself the way you are now, about four and a half feet high. Now, when you look at me through the small end of the telescope, I'm big, aren't I? Uh-huh. When you look through the small end, things look bigger. But if you turn the telescope around and look through the big end, they look smaller. Oh. Now, Jimmy, you take the telescope and look at Judy through the big end. All right. Now, hold still, Judy. <laughs> oh, my goodness, but you're little. Well, you're no bigger than Cinnamon Bear. Let me look at you, Jimmy. I bet you you're just as tiny as I am. Oh, Jimmy, you're only about four inches high. Really? There. Yeah. Now, the only thing you children have to do to be small is to see yourselves that way. But how are we going to do that, Cinnamon Bear? Yes, that's what I'd like to know. We can see each other through the telescope, all right. But how can we see ourselves? Sure, and it's simple. The first thing you do is put the telescope up on top of that dresser over there. The, the one with the looking glass. Fix it so the small end is next to the looking glass. And then look at yourselves through the big end. And presto, change all, you'll be as small as me. Isn't it fun, Jimmy? Regular magic. Sure is, all right. Now, come on and help me put this telescope on top of the dresser. It's pretty heavy. Mm-hmm. There. there. We're all set now. Now, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I almost forgot something. I'd appreciate you putting me on the top of the dresser before you degrow. I'll have a hard time getting up there by myself. Of course, Cinnamon Bear. Just hang on to my finger tight. Okay. And up you go. Thank you, Judy. Now you two can look through the telescope. All right. There. Well, I can see you and me, Judy. So can I. And we look so tiny, we... Oh! Gee willikers. You feel funny, Jimmy? Awful funny. the other end of the telescope. And look how big everything is. Well, look way over there, Judy. The trunk seems as big as a mountain. And just a minute ago, we were taller than it is. Well, well, how do you like being only four inches high? All right, I guess. Sure is funny, though. I wonder what Mother would say if she could see us now, Judy. She probably couldn't see us unless she looked awful hard. Well, we better get started now if we want to catch the crazy quilt dragon. He's got a pretty big head start. Where do we go, Cinnamon Bear? Right through that hole in the wall. Why? Well, we were down on the floor a while ago. It was only a tiny little hole. Now it looks like a tunnel. That's exactly what it is, Judy, a tunnel. And it leads to Maybe Land. Maybe Land? But you said the crazy quilt dragon probably headed for the Lollipop Mountains. Sure, and the Lollipop Mountains are located in Maybe Land. Come on, let's get started. Oh, dear. How are we ever going to get down off this big high dresser, Cinnamon Bear? In the airplane, to be sure. Why, look, Judy, over on the other side of the dresser. It's that gold glass airplane I found in the trunk. Only now it's great big. But, Cinnamon Bear, we can't go anywhere in that. 
Why, it's only a Christmas tree ornament. That's where you're very mistaken, Jimmy. That happens to be my very own extra private airplane, and it flies beautifully. Is that? It certainly does. Absolutely. And if you want to know what, I once made a transroute beer oceanic flight in it. Come along now. Why, look, Judy. It has a motor and everything. What does it run on, Cinnamon Bear? All the motors in Maybelland run on soda pop. Now, you and Judy climb in first. All right. All right. Oh, gee, this is wonderful. When do we start? In a second, Judy. Uh, can you jiggle that lever while I get the propeller going, Jimmy? Sure. Uh, uh, this one? That's right. Oh, Jimmy, I'm so excited. Contact. Contact. Hold for a minute now, and we'll be off for Maybeland. Here we go. Whee! Oh, gee. Oh, oh. I'll just circle the room a couple of times, and then we'll head for the tunnel. Where you're flying, Cinnamon Bear. Just missed hitting the trunk. I'm sorry, Judy. Hold tight now. Here we go into the tunnel. It's awful dark in here. How can you see, Cinnamon Bear? Miss you button eyes are especially good, you know. Anyway, it won't be dark for long. We're nearly through the tunnel already. Can't you see the light ahead? Sure enough. Why, look, we're outside. Oh, Jimmy, isn't it wonderful? <sighs> Why, it's the most beautiful place I've ever seen. Is this what you call maybe land? Indeed. Do lots of people live here? Scads and scads of them. All kinds of dolls and little animals and funny creatures you probably never even heard of. Are they all nice like you, Cinnamon Bear? Some are rather bad, they tell me, but of course I haven't met all the inhabitants of maybe land be a long way. Oh, it's just like a dream. What is this place we're flying over now? Those are the lollipop mountains, Judy. All those different colors you see down there are lollipop trees. Look! Is that the crazy quilt dragon? Where? Way over there, on top of that shiny cliff. Yes, sirree, it's crazy quilt, all right. And that's a cliff at the top of Looking Grass Valley. It's made entirely of looking grass. He probably picked the spot so he could bend over and admire his reflection. He's very vain. Let's hurry and catch him. We must be specially cautious. Mustn't let him know we're after him. We'd better circle over Looking Grass Valley... You know, just as if we were looking at the view and then get around in back of him and take him be surprised. That's a fine idea. My, isn't it bright, Judy? Just like looking up above you, because it reflects the sky and everything. Hello there! Did you hear somebody call? Yes, over there. Oh, me, it's that awful stork. Stork? Yes, Willy Willy, and he's a terrible nuisance. Always going around in short pants and bragging about his wonderful travels. You know, he's a globetrotter and he writes books, but don't pay any attention to him. I say, uh, hello there, and cheerio. It seems sort of impolite not to say hello to him. Oh, very well. But I warn you, he's no good at all. No good at all. Hello, Weary Willie. Greetings, my friends, greetings. Uh, could you perchance accommodate a weary wayfarer in your airplane? I've wandered many a mile and I'm most fatigued. Of course not, silly. You're bigger than our airplane is and you leave us alone. We're busy. Look. Jimmy, isn't he funny? He's wearing short pants like a mountain climber or something. And look at those horn-rimmed glasses. Look at that silly hat with a feather in it. He's the funniest stork I ever saw. <coughs> well, uh, far be it from me to intrude where I'm obviously not welcome. Of course, I cannot always expect people to be magnanimous or sensible of the extreme honor I am conferring on them by... Whatever in the world is he it. talking about, Cinnamon Bear? Don't pay any attention to him. He thinks he should talk that way because he has a diploma and writes books. Uh, I'll overlook your insinuations, Paddy O'Cinnamon. Hmm. If you cannot assist me in my flight, my young friends, perhaps you have the wherewithal to aid and abet in quenching my most ravenous thirst. He means he's thirsty. Will you please go away, Willy Willy? We're in a very great hurry to catch the crazy quilt dragon who made off with a silver star that belongs to me friends. Oh, indeed. A daring fellow, that crazy quilt. Yes, and... Furthermore, the only liquid we have on board is the soda pop that runs the aeroplane. So scram. Oh, soda pop. Uh, delectable. Uh, what flavor? Oh, raspberry. Raspberry? Oh, that will do admirably. What does he mean? <laughs> My goodness, he's picking up all the soda pop gas. Ah, oh, that was delicious, my friends. Uh, top hole. Thank you, thank you. Now I believe I'll just fly over and tell Crazy Quilt you're chasing him. Or, uh, uh, perchance, I should say we're chasing him. See you later. Bip, bip. Oh, he's flying away, Cinnamon Bear. You bad old stork. Shame on you. We're beginning to drop. Don't be afraid. We'll make it all right. 
We're going right down in Looking Glass Valley. Yes, and I can see our reflection coming up to meet us. Whee! Oh, gee! Oh, oh Jimmy! Oh, hi! Oh, my! Oh. Are you all right, children? Sure. That was nothing. I'm all right, too, Cinnamon Bear. But I'm awful angry with that mean old weary Willie Storch. So am I, and if I ever catch him, I'll make him molt where he doesn't expect to. It sure puts us in a fix. How can we ever get out of this valley? The sides are all made of looking glass, and they're straight up and down. I don't want to frighten you, children, but this is really more serious than you think. Really? What do you mean, Cinnamon Bear? Will you promise me not to get scared? We promise. We're not afraid. Well, I know all about this looking glass valley. I flew down here last year and explored it from one end to the other, and I found out what? Unless you have an airplane or can fly... Yes? There is absolutely, positively, no way to get out. My, my. Our adventurers really are in a pickle, aren't they? Out of soda pop gas on the shiny floor of Looking Glass Valley, with sides too steep to be climbed, and to make matters even more unbearable... The Crazy Quilt Dragon still has the Silver Star. Let's be sure to listen next time and see what becomes of Judy and Jimmy and the Cinnamon Bear. listening to Chesterton Radio at chestertonradio.com. Makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Company with Jim Jordan as Fibber, Donald Novus, Billy Mills Orchestra, and our special guest for tonight, Schlepperman. The show opens with I Hit a New High. have many people coming and going through your home between now and the new year. And it's important that your floors be clean and shining, protected from wear. So without delay, you should buy a can of Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. And let this remarkable no-rubbing polish make your floors shine like new. Takes only a few minutes of your time to apply glow coat. Just spread the liquid lightly over the surface with a soft cloth or long-handled glow coat applier. Then go about your other affairs. Twenty minutes later, your floor will be gleaming with a wonderful glow coat polish. After the Christmas festivities are over, your cleaning work will be easy. And your floors will have a bright start for the new year. Glow coat keeps kitchen linoleum spick and span. Protects the surface of varnished and painted wood floors from scuffing feet. Makes your home more sanitary and more attractive. Ask your dealer for Johnson's Glow Coat. The no-rubbing liquid polish that never streaks or smears. G-L-O hyphen C-O-A-T. Johnson Self-Polishing Glow Coat. shock, but tonight Fibber is not doing his Christmas shopping. It's all done. However, he's so afraid that nobody will give him the thing he really wants that he's buying it for himself. And here, squirming and elbowing his way through the mob of belated buyers at the Bon Ton department store, we find Fibber the crowd roars McGee. <laughs> Counter, yeah. Boy, what a jam. I wonder. Hey, floor walker. Yes, sir. Where do I find the stationery? The stationery what? <laughs> Listen, bud, that was not a very good joke. <laughs> oh, I know it, sir. But during the Christmas rush, we employees must take our fun where we find us. 
<laughs> yeah, I suppose so. I bet if all the Christmas shoppers that ask you foolish questions were laid end to end, you could have a lot of fun with a steamroller. Yes. <laughs> or a lawnmower, if they all had beards. Uh, <clears throat> what was it you wished to buy, sir? A pencil. Automatic pencil. Oh, yes, sir. You go right Excuse over here. Excuse me, Floor Walker. Whom do I speak to about a card table I bought from a salesman that has wobbly legs? Well, <clears throat> The, uh, the old, uh, old age pension clerk, fourth floor. Uh, <clears throat> now then, sir, about the pencil. Yeah. You'll find them second aisle over. Oh, thanks, bud. And a Merry Christmas. <laughs> the formal answer to that, sir, is the same to you. But my heart isn't in it. <laughs> Good day. Uh, pardon me. Hi, uh, girl. Hey, sis, do you carry pencils at this counter? Yes, sir. Oh, that's good. Now, I ain't a regular Christmas shopper. My shopping is all taken care of, but I do want a good automatic pencil for myself. Why, certainly, sir. Yeah. Now, here's a beautiful pencil with six different colored leads. It comes in a beautiful gift box. And... I, I don't want a gift box, and I don't want a pencil with colored leads. All I want is a good, plain, automatic pencil that makes black marks on white paper. That's simple enough, ain't it? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Who's it for, you little boy? <laughs> Dad, Braddett, I tell you, it's for me. This has nothing to do with Christmas. Then why did you want it in a gift box? Well, simply because... I don't want it in a gift box. <laughs> Listen, sis, how much is that black pencil in the case there? A special for Christmas, one dollar. Or nearly 75 cents. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, wrap it up. As a gift? Yes. No, Dad, Braddett... Oh, what's the use? Yes, wrap it as a gift and put a card in it that says, To Fibber McGee, from Fibber McGee, with difficulty. <laughs> Send it to me at 79 Wistful Vista. Yes, sir, and I can promise you, sir, it will reach you in time for Christmas. Yeah, I know. Pardon me. Pardon me, lady. I want to get through here. Yes, girl. Shucks, these clerks are so full of Christmas, they look for antlers on dray horses. Now, let's see, which way is Excuse that? Excuse me, sir. Can you tell me where the children's toys are? <laughs> well, that depends, bud. If you come home late from the movie, they're usually in the middle of the floor where you can stumble over them. A wise guy, huh? I ask a simple question, that's why. <laughs> Asking me where the children's toys are. We're standing right in the middle of the department. Something about the soldier. There's something about the soldier. He walks along with about two, three, four, five, six, seven, take it. <laughs> Slapper man. Hello, stranger. What you doing here in the toy department, Slap? Well, I'm a special salesman, Phoebe, catering to the swanky trade. I was just transferred from the men's fashions. Oh, men's fashions, eh? Yeah. Say, there's something I've been meaning to find out. Suppose I wear a brown suit, brown tie, brown hat, and brown shoes. How about socks? Put on a pair. It's considered very smart. <laughs> <laughs> but, Phoebe, let's get down to business. My time is the limit. <laughs> Phoebe, would you like something today in a cheap, high-class bottle? Nope, I got my Christmas shopping all done, Slap. I don't agree with you. What do you mean you don't agree with me? I guess I know when I got my shopping done, I guess. Phoebe, I hate to disillusion you, but when you meet a special salesman with my classification, you're doing some more shopping. <laughs> That's so. Oh, no, I'm not. I ain't buying another thing. I'm through. Uh, excuse me a minute, please. What's that? My safety valve. I'm a high-pressure salesman. <laughs> well, you can't high-pressure me. I ain't buying. My shopping is all done. Just one more thing, Phoebe. Buy a nice tricycle for your little nephew. What a bargain you'll get. I don't care if you're giving them away. I don't want a tricycle. My, my, my. Up on the housetops. Click, click, click. And he wouldn't give his little nephew a tricycle. <laughs> what are you, a Scrooge? <laughs> no, I ain't a Scrooge. But I got my Christmas shopping all done, I tell you. A fine uncle you are, Phoebe. Right now in the Yuletide, a tricycle for your little nephew would be just the thing. You ask me why? Because it's streamlined. Streamlining is from a teardrop. Whose teardrops? Your nephew's, right? Because you'll surprise him with this beautiful tricycle. Shall I wrap it up or am I too commercial? Which is it? <laughs> oh, now listen, Slap, I don't want to. Now any look tricycle. at this tricycle. There's real leather in this saddle, just like the lone stranger. <laughs> and only three wheels. A Costa wagon has four. And you save one wheel. It's a bargain, Fibby. Yeah, but shucks, I'm not. Now listen to the bell. Here. 
Ah, oh, it's so musical. I hate to let it go at fourteen fifty. <laughs> A tricycle with such a bell shouldn't go for less than seventeen fifty. It's a sacrifice with a capital Z. <laughs> but I tell you, I don't want. All right, all right, all right. Make it twelve fifty. And remember, Timmy, you talked me out of it. Not a chiseler. <laughs> well, maybe that is a good price, but shucks, I don't want. And it. only a small additional charge for delivery, and I can arrange it so you don't have to pay it. Oh, that's swell. You can carry it home. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to pay cash, or do you want to retard prosperity? Which is it? <laughs> now, take my advice and pay cash. Okay, Slip. Here you are. My, my, what a proud nephew you'll have. Uh, uh, uh. Here, carry it like this, over oh. the shoulder. Okay, okay, well, so long. I got to grab a streetcar and get home. A Merry Christmas to you, Slip. Yes, and a fancy New Year to you, Phoebe. <laughs> <laughs> and mutiny in the nursery from you, Mills. <laughs> Mutiny in the nursery. Mother Goose is on the loose. Her kids are swinging up. There's mutiny in the nursery and music in the nursery. Mother Goose is on the loose. You ought to hear him shout. If you could see Miss Jenny Jones, Jenny Jones, yeah, Jenny Jones. If you see Miss Jenny Jones, you'll find her swinging lightly. Lazy Mary won't get up. She won't get up. Won't get up. Lazy Mary won't get up. She stays up too late nightly. But she knows where to find them For they all stand around the van Wagging their tails behind them One little, two little, three little jitterbugs Four little, five little, six little jitterbugs Seven little, eight little, nine little jitterbugs Ten little jitterbug boys Ten little, nine little, eight little jitterbugs Seven little, six little, five little jitterbugs Four little, three little, two little jitterbugs One little jitterbug girl Mutiny in the nursery, Mother Goose is on the loose, her kids are swinging up. Little Jack Horner came to the corner playing his clarinet. He stuck in his thumb and played so dumb he ruined her hot duet. Mutiny in the nursery, when they all got loose, they began to yell for old Mother Goose. A goosey, goosey gander, take a tip from me. Better truck on home before you miss the jamboree. Oh, there's mutiny in the nursery. Mutiny in the nursery. Yeah, Mother Goose is on the loose. Her kids are swinging up. Her kids are swinging up. Folks, that was Mutiny in the Nursery, played by Captain Bly Mills and sung by the Four Notes. Hey, officer, is this where I catch a car to 14th Street? Sure, it is, me bucko. You think you can get on a streetcar with that tricycle, no? <laughs> oh, I think so. You'll admit it's easier than getting on a tricycle with a streetcar. <laughs> oh, here she comes. All aboard. Easy with that tricycle, mister. We're pretty crowded. Folks. Move back in the car, please. <laughs> okay, conductor, I'm on. Hey, this is kind of crowded, ain't it? Anybody got a gallon of olive oil we can pour over us? What for? <laughs> well, we might as well smell like sardines, too. <laughs> Say, conductor, would you give me a transfer? Why, certainly, Mr. Mills. Wait till I punch it. <laughs> Ain't gonna be much left of that transfer when you <laughs> won't be much left when you get through punching it, bud. Yeah, I know. But I'm going to a New Year's Eve party and I need the confetti. <laughs> Here you are, sir. Thanks. Uh, incidentally, Billy, where's Harpo? Oh, he's up ahead somewhere. See, up past the fellow carrying the Christmas tree. Oh, is he the one with the green fedora standing under the words "No rubbing, no buffing" on that glow coat car card? I think so. I'll find out. Hey, Harpo, is that you up there under that glow coat car card? The one that says Johnson self-polishing glow coat is the easiest to use preparation for floors linoleum because it shines as it dries and gives a beautiful polish with no rubbing or buffing. Now, that's the one. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah, that's him, Billy. 
Is Don Novus aboard? Yes, he is. I thought so. He always rides free. Why? Well, no conductor can ever change a tenor. Dear, dear. <laughs> hey, can you folks give us a little more room here? Thanks. Pretty crowded, isn't it, conductor? Yeah. <laughs> There's even some men standing up. <laughs> All right, folks. 23rd Street, I believe. 23rd Street. Anybody want to take a chance on this being 23rd Street? Don't you know the streets, bud? Uh, there are too many people I can't see out of the window. But I can guess pretty accurately. Oh, you can? Well, where are we now? We're just passing the brewery. Oh, no, we're not either. Stop breathing down my neck, will you, brother? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, somebody's standing on my left foot. Who is it? Who's standing on my foot? Uh, just a moment, folks. Will the person who thinks he might be standing on Mr. McGee's foot please stamp twice? <laughs> Well, oh, maybe it's me. Say, it is me! <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. I had my right foot standing on my left one. Ninth Street! Ninth Street! I hope. <laughs> Anybody want off at Ninth Street? Oh, darn it. Nobody wants off at Ninth Street. <laughs> Why'd you want him to, bud? Well, there's a big puddle of water in the gutter at Ninth Street. And I got a bet with the motorman he can't stop exactly in front of it every time. <laughs> You ought to get a job in Venice, conductor on a gondola. Hey, what do you think of the tricycle I got from my little nephew? Say, that's very nice. Yeah. Uh, Hello there, Johnny. <laughs> oh, hi, old timer. What's so amusing? Hey. I says, what's so amusing? <laughs> you busted my fountain pen with one of them handlebars, Johnny, and the ink is running down and tickling my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> it is, huh? <laughs> well, if it was warm enough to go without a shirt, you could pass as little boy blue. <laughs> of course, if it's black ink, that joke's no good. <laughs> well, I guess it's no good even if it's blue. <laughs> That's pretty good, Johnny. But that ain't the way I hear it. <laughs> The way I hear it, one feller says to the other feller, She says, I see where a couple of our prominent citizens have been accepting medals from them foreign dictators. Well, says t'other feller, you can't blame them. They didn't know they was being decorated with a double cross. Oh, hey, hey, let me off here, conductor. This is as far as I go this week. <laughs> That old crutch bender. What does he know about politics? I'll bet he thinks a foreign secretary is a stenographer with an accent. <laughs> oh, hi, Sil. I didn't know you were on this streetcar. Hi, Miss McGee, prison. We get little old tricycle. Oh, I bought that for my little nephew, Sil. Cute, ain't it? Yes, it sure is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just ain't gonna be real happy with that. Mm -hmm. I've been doing my shopping, too, prison. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What'd you get? Well, sir... For Rosebud. <laughs> Rosebud, that's my gal. <laughs> I got a I got a big bottle of toilet water. Oh. At a, a ten nights in a flower shop. <laughs> and I got a package of bath sugar. Hey, and... wait a minute. Wait a minute. Bath salt, Sil. Yes, sir, but don't you think sugar sounds better? <laughs> yeah, sugar is more refined. <laughs> Yeah. Now, what else did you get her, Sil? A nice new dress, but I'm going to give that to her till after New Year's, though. Oh, afraid she'll go to a party and spill something on it? No, sir, but if she get it before Christmas, it's only going to be a week before she can complain about it being a last year's dress. <laughs> 17th Street, I imagine. 17th Street, maybe. <laughs> Well, excuse me, please, Mr. McGee. I, I, I got to get off here and get busy with my needlework. Oh, do you do needlework? <laughs> yes, I got to sweep out a store where they sell Christmas trees. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Mr. McGee. Thank you. Sir. Oh. 
I, uh, this, this tricycle is getting a little too heavy to hold. Would you folks mind moving just a little bit, please, so as I can set this tricycle down? Oh, please, Mr. McGee. Watch out where you put those handlebars. <laughs> Excuse me, Mrs. Uppington, I didn't see you there. I didn't know you ever rode the streetcars, Uppy. Oh, yes, yes. One meets such quaint characters, doesn't one? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, tell me, Mr. McGee, huh? how much should one tip the porter on a streetcar? Tip the porter? Yes, yes. Some man took my hat and handbag a little while ago, and he took them away in a paper bag. Mm -hmm. He said he hoped I'd had a very nice trip. Oh, he was very courteous. <laughs> Hey, listen, Uppy, there ain't any porters on a streetcar. You've been gypped out of a hat and a purse. Do you realize that? Really? Oh, 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 oh. isn't that amusing? <laughs> Was there much money in the handbag? No, no, Mr. McGee, just a few dollars. Oh, and a Christmas check for my brother for a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars? Look, do you realize that all he's got to do is forge your name on the back of that check and get the money? Oh, now, don't be upset, Mr. McGee. He couldn't do that, you know. He couldn't? No, no, no. He wouldn't know what name to forge, really. <laughs> well, why not? It's made out to you, ain't it? Of course not, silly boy. It's made out to cash. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, conductor, don't forget to tell me when we get to 14th Street. I won't, Mr. McGee. Uh, by the way, did I get your fare, sir? Who, mine? Uh, no, the heavy set gentleman behind you. Oh, I'd like to see, but I ain't got room to turn around. I think the nickel nudger refers to me, my boy. Oh, I see. I know that voice. Horatio K. Boomer. How are you, Boomer? Very well, thank you, spark plug. <laughs> I still didn't get your fare, mister. Oh, yes, the fare. Forgetful of me, the fare. <laughs> I think I have a transfer here somewhere. Let me see. Transfer, transfer. Hey, that's my pocket. Oh, yes, yeah, so it is, so it is. <laughs> Natural mistake. Used to have a suit just like that myself. But I tore the seat of the pants one night, jumping out of a patrol, out of a friend's limousine. <laughs> and let me see now. Where did I put that transfer? You probably got absent-minded again and picked your own pocket. If I had, I'd have caught me and made me put it back. <laughs> Let me see now where I put that transfer, transfer, transfer. Here's a Christmas card I'm sending to the quintuplet's mother. What's that address again? Oh, yes, general delivery. Let's see. Uh, 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 I've got uh, ladies' platinum wristwatch. Ah, oh, the dear girl. To think I shall never meet her again. For having any luck. Let's see now. Stethoscope for listening to vault combinations. Heard one last night with a leaky ventricle. Interesting case. Needed a change and a rest. I left the change and took the rest. Yes, indeed. And a short beer. Well, well, well. Imagine that. No transfer. Oh, well, must be getting off here anyway. I'm taking pot luck tonight with a small group of poker players. Good day, meatball. <laughs> so long, Gail Bates. Pardon me, pardon me. Uh, that's an Say, Billy, I think Don's got time to sing a number before we get to 14th Street. What you got ready? How about deep in a dream, Don? Okay, let's go. Lady, will you move a little to one side so my trombone player can go to work? I'm sorry, I can't move an inch. Well, how about bending your elbow a little? No, thank you. I'm on the wagon. Oh. <laughs> Didn't mean it. Well, go ahead, Billy. Folks, Don Nova's singing deep in a dream. I've always been a dreamer For I was born that way And I was born to love you Keep dreaming of you each day Dim all the lights and I sink in my chair The smoke from my cigarette climbs through the air The walls of my room fade away in the blue And I'm deep in a dream of you But 
smoke makes a stairway for you to descend. You come to my arms, may this bliss never end. For we love anew, just as we used to do. When I'm deep in a dream of you, then from the ceiling, sweet music comes stealing. We glide through a lover's refrain. You're so appealing that soon I'm revealing my love for you over again. My cigarette burns me, I wake with a start. My hand isn't hurt, but there's pain in my heart. Awake or asleep, every memory I'll keep. Deep in a dream of you. That was beautiful, Don. You ought to sing on the streetcar oftener. You certainly pack them in. Say, Fibber. What you want, Harpo? I wanted to ask you if you'd come over to our house tonight and play Santa Claus for my kid brother. I've got the uniform. Well, why don't you do it? Oh, he's laying for me. Because I gave him an air rifle instead of a twenty two last year. Oh, he's even got skyrockets aimed up the chimney. Oh, I see. He has. Well, what makes you think I'm more fireproof than you? <laughs> oh, not that I couldn't do it. I used to be a professional Santa Claus, Harpo. And all the kids had raised cane if I didn't bring them candy. Candy Cane McGee, I was known as in them days. <laughs> candy Cane McGee, the kind and crafty old coot constantly calling on convenient communities with carloads of cakes, cookies, and candies for cunning cusses and covered cribs, capably comforted and crying cupies with careful kindness and collections of cotton cats, and considered by cross-country consensus the King Kong of Chris Kringles from the cold crags of Colorado to the crested combers of the Caribbean. <laughs> Fourteenth Street, I believe. Fourteenth Street, no doubt. Mr. McGee, here comes Fourteenth Street. Okay, hold it for me, bud, till I get off. All right, folks, now please let me get off. I'm sorry, Please. Let me out, please, folks. Don't grab the tricycle, little boy. That's a good boy. Excuse me, bud, can I get through here? Wow. I'm certainly glad to get off of there. I ain't been squeezed so hard since I made out my income tax. <laughs> well, no, all I gotta do is take the tricycle well, home. Well, hello there, Fisher. A Merry New Year is and a delightful Yuletide to you, and the same to me, thank you. <laughs> well, how are you, Nick? Come on, walk along with me over to the house. Gee, I'm glad to get the fresh air again after riding in that streetcar. Sure. Riding in crowded streetcars is not my ideas of a thing to do if I can avoid you. But why are you taking a streetcar when you're having a cute little velocipus you can ride yourself away with? <laughs> oh, this velocipus, or velocipede, is, that's for my little nephew, Nick. <laughs> sure had an awful time getting it home, but it's going to be worth it. You got the shopping done for all your kids? Oh, sure. Saturday nights, I'm dressing up in the Krauss crumbled red union suits. And I'm coming down the smokestacks like a stork bringing in new babies. Only I hope not. <laughs> My little Demetrios is hardly waiting till Santa Puss is starting to drive his team of buffaloes through the snow drifts. <laughs> Not buffaloes, reindeer. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I think I'm making myself a very foolish proof Santa Kringle, which is only me traveling in cognite gown. <laughs> My red suits is fitting me like the wallpaper on my back. <laughs> in short, you think you'll do all right, huh? No, Fisher. In shorts, I would freeze my knees off, I should <laughs> So you're giving your little nephew little a velocipus. Not nep little, nephew. Well, a little is a few. <laughs> How old is this kid being, Fisher? Oh, he's just a little tad. He's only... Uh, only... Well, I'll be a... Uh, well, for the... What's the matter with me, anyway? Well, it's taking me too long to go into that now, Fisher. <laughs> what do you think? You know what I done, Nick? Huh? I let a high-pressure salesman sell me this tricycle for my little nephew. Sure, I think that is a very appropriate Christmas present. Yeah, but you don't understand, Nick. 
I just happened to think. I ain't even got a nephew. <laughs> Just now, I think you'll be interested to know that more than a million new housewives have started using Johnson's self-polishing glow coat during the past two years. And here's why. Glow coat is easy to apply. Glow coat gives linoleum and other floors a shield of bright protection, closing the cracks and pores against dirt and germs. When your kitchen linoleum is wearing a beautiful glow coat polish, it'll be easy to, as easy to clean as a china plate. You owe it to yourself to learn this modern labor-saving way of caring for all your floors. Glow Coat assures you less work and more play, and it earns you the reputation of being a wonderful housekeeper. Buy a can of Johnson's Glow Coat tomorrow and insist on the real thing, Johnson's self-polishing Glow Coat. And remember, whenever you buy a polish for your floors, your furniture, your linoleum, or your car, you can have special confidence in all the Johnson Wax products. Folks, in addition to thanking Mr. Sam Hearn Schlepperman for being our guest tonight, we want to extend our sincere wishes for a wonderful Christmas to all of you. You've given us the best Christmas present you possibly could by making this the biggest year that the makers of Johnson's Wax Products ever had. And we hope your new year will be as bright as the floors and furniture you use your wax on. And though Molly can't be with us on the program yet, she wants me to wish you a special Merry Christmas for her. So here it is. Merry Christmas, folks, and good night. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's self-polishing glow coat, Racine, Wisconsin, inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. Heard on this program was Mutiny in the Nursery from the production Golan Place. This is the National Broadcasting Company needs the comfort and inspiration of religious faith, for it is faith which helps hold our families together, builds moral and spiritual character. And today, perhaps more than ever before, there's a need to turn to a way of life based on the enduring principles of religion. There are a great many programs of religious nature on NBC Radio, which you'll enjoy hearing this Sunday. Among them, The Art of Living, The National Radio Pulpit, Eternal Light, the Lutheran Hour, the Catholic Hour, and the Hour of Decision conducted by Billy Graham. These are but a few of the broadcasts that will bring you inspiration and comfort not only this Sunday, but on the Sundays to come. Of course, the Easter message will be the highlight event this week. We know you'll enjoy hearing them as a supplement to your visit to the church of your choice. And when you do go to church this Sunday, take the whole family with you. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. Uh-uh-uh-uh, don't turn that dial. This is the right station. If you want to hear about Jonathan Thomas and his Christmas on the moon... Jonathan Thomas, who has just turned six, got himself in a terrible fix. He went to bed at half past eight, which isn't early, nor is it late. And he went to sleep with his teddy bear, Guz. He never could sleep without Guz, because... Well, then when the chime on the clock struck nine, and when it would seem he had begun to dream, a beam from the moon came into his room, and two funny people named Ezra and Jeepel slid down and started to frown at Jonathan Thomas and Guz. Well, then Guz woke up and chased them up, as any teddy bear should do. And then Jonathan Thomas, he woke up, too, because he heard the fuzz that was made by Guz. And he joined the chase to the funniest place since the world began. And pretty soon he met a man who turned out to be, as he could plainly see, the man in the moon. Then pretty soon, when he was in his room, there was the awfulest noise, even worse than boys can make with their toys. And he got more scared than he dared or cared to let on, because Guz was gone. And he sighed and nearly cried. And if he had, it wouldn't have been bad. And do you know because? The Squibblums had kidnapped Santa Claus. Mr. 
Mr. Man in the Moon. Oh, for goodness sakes. Stop calling me Mr. Man in the Moon. Oh, but I thought that was your name. Oh, how very silly. If it's your name, how could it be mine? But it isn't, because my name is Jonathan Thomas. That's a fibber, because my name isn't Jonathan Thomas. My name's nothing of the sort. And I'll be pleased if you'll call me that from now on. Yes, sir. Thank you, please, Mr. Nothing of the Sort. But could maybe I ask you a question? I don't know. <laughs> have you ever tried it? Please, Mr. Nothing of the Sort, why do we have to come here to old King Cole's court? My goodness gracious, what an easy question. <laughs> we come here to King Cole's court because we don't have to go there. And anybody knows that King Cole's court isn't there. It's here. There is where the old folks stay. Oh. Oh, what? Just, oh. Oh, because I wish we could go look for Gaz. Well, I guess there's nothing to stop us. We can look for him or five him or even six him. Well, if we have enough time. And if we haven't, maybe we can borrow some from anybody. He's got lots of time on his hands. to the very best sort, for it's the court of old King Cole. Let the good be good and stand as they should, and the bad make confession, for this court is now in session. <laughs> His Majesty King Cole. <laughs> oh dear. <clears throat> uh, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody else, uh, this is the most serious moment of history. <laughs> and anybody who ever studied history knows how serious that is. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean to say, you all know that Santa Claus has been kidnapped. And if he isn't rescued, there won't be any Christmas this year. And you know what that means. It means that... No toys for the boys, no curls for the girls, and Christmas will be very sad. That day of the year will be without cheer. No presents or candy or things. No come, all ye faithful, no carol that sings. And the day will be bad, not merry or glad. And no presents that send to close the ring. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> now then, I am certain that there is a traitor in our midst. There is someone in this city of, oh my goodness, who is a spy for the terrible Squibblums who kidnapped our dear Mr. Claus. Therefore, we are now going to hold court to find the guilty culprit. And I do hereby and herewith elect Professor I. M. Looney to act as prosecuting attorney and the tired lion... Mr. Loudly O'Rourke to act as the defense attorney. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Your Majesty, and ladies and gentlemen. And now, first of all, we shall proceed. Will the clerk of the court please ask Mr. Humpty Dumpty to come forth? <laughs> I think you'd better have him come first instead of fourth, Mr. Looney, <laughs> so we can keep the numbers straight. Yes, very well, Your Majesty. Will the clerk of the court please call Mr. Humpty Dumpty to the stand? Humpty Dumpty to the stand! Oh, yeah, yeah, here I am. Uh, uh, Sit down. Uh, oh, gosh. Now then, Mr. Clerk of the Court, swear the witness. Oh, uh, uh, no, 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 listen, Your Majesty. If you bring me up here just to swear at me, I ain't a going to stay. I don't like being swore at. I said swear the witness, Mr. Humpty Dumpty, not swear at the witness. The word at being a preposition to show the relationship between the object and the verb. And one should never, never end a sentence with a preposition. <laughs> yeah, what about a jail sentence, Professor Looney? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> if you please, if you please, Your Majesty. Now then, Mr. Humpty Dumpty, where were you on the evening of the second Tuesday of last week? Uh, mm. 
No play. Aha. But can you prove it? Uh, nope. But I sure can recite verses. Oh, no, no, no. Don't dare. Don't dare. I warn you. I'll, I'll go to pieces. I'll go to pieces. In the middle of the night when the sun was shining bright and the stars merrily twinkling, oh. no sound was around and the still was so shrill that nobody could hear oh, the listening. I, I, I'm going to pieces. I'm going to pieces. Oh, 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 is that due to the fact that Professor Looney has just <laughs> gone to pieces? A court is now adjourned <laughs> until we put him back together. <laughs> Time has come for everyone to take their seats again. And if you fail, you'll go to jail, which is commonly called the pen. Sit down. <laughs> uh, call the next witness. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, Jonathan Thomas to the stand. Jonathan Thomas to the stand. Where is Jonathan Thomas? If you please, sir, I'm right here. Huh. That's what you say. But I say that you're wrong here. And the proof. Of the pudding is in the eating. Oh, goody. <laughs> the plum pudding, eh? <laughs> With mint sauce, Professor Looney. <laughs> if, 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 if you please, Your Majesty. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, proceed. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, now then, Jonathan Thomas, uh, do you solemnly swear that you will uh, bill fill the sack doodle of the Billwig Straddle Hartnicks? Of the true brassy of the Crowley Dinches of the Neriopus Cop, so help me, Hannah, say I do. I do. What if you see? Ah! You see, Your Majesty? A fading. And all one needs is but one look at this cringing crook of crying crime, criminally conspiring, scamp of cut walling in his cataclysmic catastrophes, course scratch. And unchristian company would claim, consider him considerably crazy. A complete confession of contemptible, contemptuousness of contempt of court. Unquote. Now, answer my question, can you? Or can't you, 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 you? Can I? What? If you please? Aha! Evading again. <laughs> now, if you please, Your Majesty, you'll notice that he is about to cry. <laughs> trying to soothe their sympathy with silly sobs of sappy suffering. So strife will cease, and success seem to strike sorrow subservient. But I say, Your Majesty, he is guilty. Hey, hey, hey. Quiet, 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 quiet. <laughs> so it seems there's something in what you say. <laughs> Proceed. Proceed, I will. I accuse this prisoner of the bar of being a spy for the terrible Squeebublum. For Santa Claus was not kidnapped until after Jonathan Thomas, alias Johnny the Jip, alias Jonah the Jinx, arrived in our fair, fair city. Oh, oh my goodness. Which proves it? Your Majesty, I accuse Jonathan Thomas of being responsible for Santa Claus being kidnapped. And I recommend that he be spanked by the royal spankers and also be given two bottles of castor oil. But I do like castor oil. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> Your Majesty, I rest my jolly old case. Oh, well, uh, thanks, Looney, <laughs> old fellow. <laughs> <clears throat> now, Jonathan Thomas, since you were accused of being a spy for the Squibblums, you must be one. And therefore, it is the sentence of this court that you go to the land of Squibbubble and bring back Santa Claus. And if you fail, well, I don't like castor oil either. <laughs> <laughs> And what will happen to him in the land of the terrible Squibobbles? Well, you'll certainly find out in the next chapter of the story of Jonathan Thomas and his Christmas on the Moon. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com.